Hey everyone, and forgive me if I look or sound really tired in this video. I woke up and started working 10 hours ago by the time I'm recording this, and I'm very, very tired. So forgive me for any mistakes. So this week we've got a gigantic interview from Pierre-Lou Griffet from Valve talking about SteamOS, Steam Machines, anti-chi, third-party manufacturers, and everything around that. We've got Facebook blocking links to certain Fediverse platforms because they're just that petty. And we've got Apple pulling their AI out of all the iPhones that got it because it's just so bad. And we also have a lot of other stuff, including our sponsor. This video is sponsored by Squarespace, your all-in-one platform to create, manage, and publish your own website. Squarespace has really easy tools to make sure anyone can end up with a nice-looking, well-optimized website, no matter if they know how to code or not. They have what they call their blueprint system, which lets you pick from a variety of templates that are pre-built and will suit any type of website, whether it's a simple blog, an online store, a video platform, whatever. On top of that, to go further, Squarespace has their own design engine to create your own pages. You can just drag and drop elements where you want them, and you can change the colors, the fonts, and just tweak the template however you want. And once you have something you like, you can add extra features like creating your own online shop, complete with a payment system that handles credit cards, PayPal, Apple Pay, and more. So check out squarespace.com slash the Linux experiment. The link is in the description. So you can give Squarespace a shot and you'll also get 10% off your first website or domain name purchase. Okay, so let's begin with Valve. Pierre-Lou Griffet, Valve's principal engineer on SteamOS and Proton, talked at CES about SteamOS and the Steam Deck. And there are some interesting things in there. So the interview was given in French, so I will show auto-translated parts of it right here, so forgive me if they are not really written in Shakespeare English, it's Google Translate. First, the reason why SteamOS was not released earlier, and still isn't, even though it's coming this year, is because of drivers. Apparently, Intel drivers, presumably on the GPU and integrated GPU side of things, but also mostly NVIDIA drivers were not up to snuff for Valve to feel like they could just package all of that and ship it for everyone to enjoy. There was also the installer issue, where it just takes time to provide all the installation options that people expect from a Linux distro. It just was not a priority before, because SteamOS just was flashed in the factory on Steam Dex, and that was it. Pierre Lou also talked about other gaming distros like Nobara, Chimera OS, and others, and he said that these provide valuable work in terms of shipping a unified product that amalgamates work from various other developers. He also said that SteamOS will use things developed by the community, for example, they use Input Plumber for the Lenovo Legion Go S to actively and rightly map the controls. As he says, they are not that interested in reinventing the wheel. They would much rather prefer you something that exists, provided that this thing meets their standards. On the Lenovo Legion Go S, he also said that it's Lenovo who approached them because they wanted to offer a better software experience. And as per how SteamOS will be distributed and updated on that device and other third-party devices, Pierre Lou said that Valve prefers having control over the drivers themselves, to be able to fix issues in the games without having to wait for a specific developer to support the game on their platform. But everything related to the BIOS and to the firmware will be provided by the manufacturer of the device and distributed through SteamOS. Valve apparently has four developers working on the open source NVIDIA drivers. He didn't mention if it was the official modules or NVK and Nuvo, I would guess it's the latter. He also said that they started working on AMD drivers in 2017, so it took them a while to get things to a status where they were comfortable with the performance, and presumably it took them the same amount of time to get uh, Nuvo and NVK, or even the Intel drivers if they started contributed to that, to an acceptable state. Finally, on SteamOS, he said that the goal was not to outcompete Windows or to gain all the market share. It's to have a different system with different priorities and a different experience. 
The goal is not to woo away every Windows user if they're happy on Windows, which I think is sound. As per Steam Machines, Pierre Lou said that handhelds are the priority right now, not home consoles, but they might open that door in the future. He concluded on anti-cheat and he said that developers don't just forget to tick a checkbox. It's more work than that. It's more that they don't want to provide the ongoing support for the platform to make sure that the anti-cheat keeps doing its job even on SteamOS. Pierre Lou also seemed confident that things will get better with time, saying that the types of games relying heavily on anti-cheat are generally shooters or competitive games that are not necessarily the best games to be played on a handheld. But he also said that if the user base increases, game developers might just allocate more time to the platform, and he concluded saying he really was not worried about this uh, going in the future. Now that was a very interesting thing to read, if you can forgive the haphazard translation that Google Translate gave of the webpage. It shows that Valve is still very pragmatic about things. They don't have a 10 year long plan, or at least they are not communicating it. They're just moving towards a certain goal, which is let's provide a good experience and good hardware. And if people start biting, then we can improve the experience more and more and build a bigger team. They're not functioning as a startup trying to build a specific team to take on Windows. They're just doing their thing. And if it works, it will grow. And if it doesn't work, it will stagnate or be deleted. And that's about it. I think it's a sound approach. It also shows that they're not necessarily focused on helping Linux gaming, for example, through anti-cheat. They are more focused on helping handheld and SteamOS gaming, which is not always exactly the same thing. Now, apparently Meta is now banning links to PixelFed posted on Instagram. They're marking them as spam. If you don't know about it, PixelFed is a Fediverse service. It's an alternative social network to Instagram, much like Mastodon is the open source decentralized alternative to Twitter or X or whatever you want to call that hellhole. PixelFed is the same kind of alternative to Instagram. Zuckerberg recently announced that they would relax all the moderation and fact-checking rules, at least in the US. They don't seem too keen on doing that in the EU because they know they would get banned instantly and they apparently don't want to let go of that revenue. So it's free speech, but only for US citizens because, yeah, they prefer money to actual free speech, I think. Now, these moderation and rules that they're going to change include some very overt anti-LGBTQ stances and apparently led a lot of people to leaving Instagram and moving to PixelFed. It's apparently an unprecedented level of traffic. And thus, Meta started blocking links to that platform, which is insane because even with huge levels of traffic, let's be honest, it will never compete with Instagram. It can't. It's not VC funded. They actively refuse VC funding, so it cannot grow through ads or giant development sprints. It cannot really communicate its existence to a lot of people and draw people to the service. And I highly doubt that the exodus towards PixelFed is massive enough to have any impact on Meta's bottom line. So on the one hand, you have Meta saying that they want less of what they call censorship, but that's actually removing harmful information that is blatantly untrue. And on the other hand, they're just censoring links. At any rate, no matter where you fall on that issue, I'm on PixelFed. If you want to try it out, uh, you can follow me at the Linux EXP at pixelfed.social. Social media has never been for the good or even the betterment of humanity. It's always been pretty crap, but the Fediverse services are really the only ones that I'll use because while they don't enrich my life in any way, they're actually not actively evil, which is more than what I can say for big, well-known social networks these days. Now, it turns out Apple's AI features were so bad that they already pulled them out of every iPhone that got them. It's only temporary, of course, they're gonna bring them back, but it's a strong indication that the stuff just was not ready for prime time deployment, at least not Apple's implementation of it. The feature specifically tended to create completely misleading and false notifications out of various headlines from news outlets and out of the messages users received. 
Apple thus disabled the features in the software update, but obviously they will re-enable them later. The thing generated a lot of complaints from the BBC and other news outlets because the feature created notifications that stated these outlets said something when they really never said that. The AI just misread or misinterpreted the actual headlines and summarized it in a way that was completely and factually inaccurate. Of course, this isn't just Apple's problem. Every AI vendor has the exact same issue to deal with. A large language model has no concept of truth. It doesn't know if what it's telling you is true or not. They're not trained this way. There is no truth parameter and you can manipulate an AI to tell you anything you want, whether it contradicts something that they've said before or not. And if they contradict themselves and you remark on it, they're going to invent a lie to justify why they lied. This will not be fixed in the current way of doing LLMs. And it is the major problem affecting AI right now, because you're giving people a tool that answers their questions without them having to do any research. But the information you're giving them is factually incorrect a lot of the time and thus cannot be trusted most of the time. I recently heard someone I can't quite remember who called AI devil tech and it made me laugh. It made me think of people shying away from oxen dragging a plow through a field. But also the description is kind of accurate. Like right now, the net result of having AI in our lives is a net negative, a big, big net negative compared to what it brings. And honestly, there's no sign of improvement. Everything that gets released is worse than the previous iteration. So yeah. Now on to less dire topics. Linux Mint 22.1 is now released. I already have a video on my YouTube channel showing all the new features. Go check that out if you plan on upgrading or on switching to Mint. What you have to know is that it offers the Cinnamon Desktop 6.4. It's still based on Ubuntu 24.04 LTS and it runs the kernel 6.8. The headline features are a new default theme for Cinnamon, better dialogues for the Cinnamon shell and a much better Wayland session. Although it's still not the default and it's still not finished because for example, you can't switch keyboard layouts. You also get power modes on laptops, uh, meaning you can go to power saver, balanced and stuff like that. Finally, you also have a nightlight feature that works straight from the distro settings and also supports Wayland. Notifications can now appear above full screen windows. The alt tab switcher places minimized windows at the end of the list. You can show the password that you're typing on the lock screen and you can bind Nemo actions to keyboard shortcuts. They also improve the default Mint Y theme with rounded corners, better contrast, and they also modernized the entire apt based or Debian packages based stack relying on Mint's own tools, meaning that you should have better translated stuff, fewer bugs when handling packages and updates. And for Mint developers, it means a much simpler architecture for all of their graphical tools, which they rebuilt with those new libraries, which means better performance, simpler development, and generally just a good experience if you like their packages. Go check out my video, but I'm glad to see if you want to know more, go check out my video. It's like right there on my channel. It's the one I made just before this one. And honestly, I think it's good to have one more consumer facing distro working on Debian packages and all the underlying tools, graphical or not, that work with them. This stack works, but it's old, it's scrummy, and it's got plenty of dependency problems. If Mint can fix all of that, I think it's gonna be for the best for everyone. Now let's talk about GNOME 48 and there's an interesting new thing that is planned. It looks like it's gonna get a digital well-being feature, which is all of those things calculating your screen time and telling you uh, to rest your eyes to move away from the screen and stuff like that. In the latest GNOME Shell 48 Alpha, GNOME can now remind you to take breaks from looking at your screen. You will get notifications to tell you to get away from the computer for a few seconds to relax your eyes or to get up and walk a little bit. And there's also a planned digital well-being page in the GNOME settings with a graph of how long you've used your computer each day and options to set a bedtime schedule. So being told, hey, dude, it's 11 p.m. Just go to bed. You can also set your screen time limits. You can set the break notifications that you have to move around, relax your eyes. Of course, everything is optional and you can disable it. 
On top of that, it looks like GNOME 48 will have a few cool things like improved color management support, fixes to avoid the CPU stalling when using dedicated GPUs from Nvidia that are attached to external displays, you'll get fixes for touchscreen drag and drop on X Wayland, better cursor scaling, and a few sovereign tech fund projects being shipped as well. Pretty interesting stuff, all of that digital well-being stuff doesn't really apply to me because I'm a very lazy person and so I tend to always want to do something else than work, so I always get away from the computer when I should be working, so I don't need notifications to remind me of that because it will make me work less uh, and actually not as well. But for a lot of people that's interesting to have and also GNOME 48 looks like it's gonna be packed to the gills with new stuff which is nice because it's been a few years uh, since GNOME has really pushed something new and interesting onto their users. And let's conclude on some gaming stuff. The anti-sync driver will apparently finally arrive in the Linux kernel 6.14. As a reminder this driver really does what F-Sync or E-Sync do for Proton or Wine, but they do it at the kernel level, meaning it's not subject to the limitations of user space processes, and so it can access more resources and be scheduled differently. This should result in much better gaming performance. On some tested titles, it can go from plus 21% FPS up to plus 678% if you compare it with Upstream Wine. Compared to eSync or F-Sync, it will be less of an improvement, but it should still make things a lot more reliable and at least the frame timings should be much better. The driver should be available to everyone in March, provided your distro updates you and provided the Proton or Wine build start using the driver instead of their own implementations of eSync and F-Sync. I'm sure we'll see plenty of benchmarks comparing the current solutions to this new driver and I'm sure we'll see that it's really a big leap in terms of performance even compared to using normal Proton, GE Proton or whatever else and honestly Linux gaming already performs really really well, a lot better than Windows in a lot of games so gaining even more FPS without having to do anything on our end is pretty nice. Pretty nice like our sponsor Tuxedo Computers. They make desktops and laptops that ship with Linux pre-installed. All the components inside and all the hardware is picked specifically because it runs really well under Linux and they actually develop some additional drivers and tools to ensure that everything works really well. They have a big range of computers from laptops, desktops, something for office work, for gaming, some workstations, anything you might imagine with a lot of customization options on the hardware, on the keyboard layouts, on the logos you want displayed. Everything is really, really customizable. I only use Tuxedo computers these days. Everything I do related to a podcast, to the channel, to video editing, publishing, anything is done on one of their laptops and all my gaming needs are done on one of their desktops. So if you need a new computer, you want to run Linux on it and you want to make sure that your money goes towards a company that actively contributes to Linux, click the link in the description and check out Tuxedo Computers. They're all I use and they're really, really good. They've been supporting me for more than three years and there's a reason why they're still my sponsor. Anyway, thank you all for watching. You know what to do with the YouTube buttons. The channel is actually starting to grow back again in January. So whatever you're doing with the buttons and the comments, it's working. Keep doing it. If you want to support the channel, plenty of links in the description below. You know how it works. And thank you for watching. I guess you'll hear me in the next one. Bye.